Thanks. So um, just to give a run of show, we're going to have an opening talk by Professor Terry Sunderland, who's going to give an overview of the many ways that trees and forests can contribute to food systems. And then we're going to hear from three distinguished panelists giving different perspectives from different parts of the world on how forests and trees already contribute and can contribute more to our food systems. Then we're gonna have a question for our panelists followed by question, questions and answers that we're gonna be taking from the audience. So please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, Vito, can you go to the next slide, please? Thanks so much. Um, so we have, I think, a small correction here. One of our speakers was going to be speaking in French, um, and he has graciously agreed to give his talk in English um, because we were having some trouble with the interpretation function. Um, so um, thank you so much, Alain, for being willing to, to give your presentation in English. And um, I think, that's it for the housekeeping details. Um, and I think we can go straight to uh, Professor Terry Sunderland. Thank you, Amy. That's a nice introduction. Um, can we have the first slide, please? Or the next slide, I'd rather. Um, there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence that's been generated looking at how forests and trees play very much an integral role in food security and nutrition and sustainable food systems, particularly with reference to the tropics. Uh, next slide, please. So our uh, global food system is, is currently, well, it's been described in many ways, but um, I think the term that uh, often resonates with me is it's, it's a somewhat broken food system. We're producing very successfully more food than we ever have before in human history. Um, and as we'll hear, that's mostly focused on calories rather than diversity. And a lot of that food we know is wasted. There's also vast inequities in the distribution of food in terms of food sovereignty. Um, people wake up to a, either a daily feast or famine. Um, and the distribution of food is, is extremely inequitable on a global um, basis. There's been a strong dietary shift um, from more diverse plant-based diets with complex carbohydrates to more commodity crops. We know about this, this is going to be talked about um, in this session, um, with a stronger emphasis on meat production and more refined carbohydrates. And essentially our food systems have become very simplified and this has a huge impact on, on nutrition uh, overall. And these dietary transitions, as we're seeing them rapidly change because of increased purchasing power, urbanization, um, and the need to feed ever-growing urban populations from an ever-dwindling, if you like, um, rural resource. Next slide, please. So the effects of dietary simplification, um, I'm sure others will touch on this. So we're not doing so well in terms of, of main, maintaining uh, diverse, nutritious diets on a global scale. Um, as I mentioned, there's feast or famine. A billion people are classified as hungry and one to two billion people are classified as overweight or obese. So you have this sort of dichotomy, if you like, in the food system. The current agricultural system is a major driver of envir environmental degradation. Um, and essentially, um, we are simplifying not only our diets, but also our landscapes. And these landscapes become increasingly vulnerable to environmental shocks, climate related pest diseases, market forces, etc. Um, and uh, this is also obviously problematic. Next slide, please. So in terms of the environmental impacts, I've just touched on the nutritional impacts. So we know that agricultural ex expansion is responsible for 40% of permanent forest loss. So permanent forest loss means that forest will not be transformed or allowed to regenerate in any way. And this is a permanent transformation to commodity crops, particularly oil palm, soy, uh, cattle, etc. We know that vast amounts of the world's fresh water is used to um, support our agricultural systems. Soil erosion is a particular problem and agriculture accounts for a significant amount of our greenhouse gas emissions. And 
still agriculture relies heavily on fossil fuels for fertilizer, but also mechanization as well. Next slide, please. But what's often neglected is the role of smallholder producers who work, live and work in very complex multifunctional landscapes. And we kind of estimate that there's about 2 billion people living and working in these multifunctional landscapes that are producing food in very complex systems, production systems. And estimates as to the amount of global food produced range from 30% to 70 to 80%. Either way, that's a significant amount of food. Um, and this produces a wide range of products, providing individual resilience, but also family and community resilience against economic and environmental shocks. Yet conversely, um, and in fact, the more perverse incentives to um, environmental degradation, very few smallholders receive subsidies compared to, if you think, the Western farmers of North America or for um, uh, the, you know, the, the EU policy, the common agricultural policy, uh, which supports heavily the, um, the livelihoods of, of farmers uh, cultivating on, on a monocropping based system. And here's a big difference is that small home farming systems tend to rely on temporary deforestation. So Sweden agriculture, managing forests for food in a patchwork <coughs> of shifting cultivation, which is a huge difference to uh, essentially the, the permanent co conversion we're talking about for commodity crops. And smallholder farmers are recognized for their conservation of agrobiodiversity. Agrobiodiversity we need um, in order to breed um, pest and disease resistant crops. Uh, and much of the, the, the developments that have happened um, in the last 40 to 50 years in terms of new varieties, resistant varieties, have relied on the importance of agrobiodiversity. Next slide, please. So the contributions of forest to food security can be summar summarized in two ways. Uh, the direct contribution, so essentially, <coughs> excuse me, the harvest of bushmeat, wild fruits and other forest source um, foods, often rich in uh, micronutrients, um, providing both subsistence and sale, but also important for safety nets when agricultural systems uh, don't perform as well as they ought. As I mentioned, sweat and agriculture is extremely important. So the, the provision of forest allows that farming system to, to create mosaic landscapes um, in predominantly forested landscapes. And in terms of uh, indirect contributions, you know, there's a lot of work being done now on forest ecosystem services that support food production. And we think about water regulation, pollination, soil, uh, nutrient contribution, etc. <coughs> and forest generated income. So if you think about other forest uh, activities, the sale of non-timber forest products, timber, um, often contribute towards uh, livelihood strategies needed for agricultural production, fodder for livestock, and very importantly, wood for energy and cooking. And in many respects, um, the ability to heat uh, water, for example, to make it potable uh, is extremely important. To be able to cook certain um, agricultural produce uh, to make them palatable is, is a major um, contribution of forests to food security. Next slide, please. And this horrible spaghetti diagram basically shows what those contributions are. The provisioning services um, at the top there, non-provisioning ecosystem services, and how they relate to the four pillars of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, there's been a number of um, processes to understand the role of forests and food security. And two of those uh, that I can highlight is, is a report commissioned by the International Union of Forest Research Organizations as part of their global forest expert panels, um, did a very extensive review from 2015, 2017, uh, looking, uh, to, sorry, it was published in 2015, um, getting the forestry community to understand the importance of forest management for food security and nutrition. And I must admit, when I first came to um, the Faculty of Forestry at UBC about three and a half years ago, a number of people said to me, my goodness, what the heck have forests got to do with food security and nutrition? Um, so it, it, it really is an intractable issue. Uh, a lot of forestry professionals do not understand how, the role of forest and food security. And conversely, um, the UN's um, uh, CFS Committee on Food Security commissioned a report looking at sustainable forestry and food security. And really that was focused on getting the nutrition and food security community to understand the role of forests for food security and nutrition. And the next stage really, and I'm sure we'll touch on this in this, in this uh, uh, summit, is that 
how do we use those findings, that evidence, to influence the policy arena and get food and forestry much better interlinked, food systems and forestry better interlinked? And is the focus now on SDG2, zero hunger, is that really the, an entry point in order to do so? Next slide, please. And we know that um, food production systems, as I mentioned, are extremely uh, deleterious towards biodiversity, biodiversity we all rely on. And if you just push the animation button quickly, sorry, Levita. Um, and it is possible to actually achieve food security and nutrition without clearing forests. And this is a, a report from FAO that shows that a number of countries have been able to do that. Next slide, please. And so there's a number of key messages. So Vito, just feel free to push the, the button as the animation comes up. Um, essentially, um, agricultural expansion into the forest frontier needs to be halted. There are numerous global agreements. The New York Declaration of Forests state that there will be a moratorium on increased agricultural uh, um, expansion into, into the forest frontier. We know that diverse forests and tree-based production systems are more advantageous because of their adaptability and resilience, both economically and environmentally. The importance of ecosystem services are really coming to the fore in terms of our understanding of the, the complexities of multifunctional landscapes, looking at both food production, nutrition, but broader environmental and human health, and in, especially so with the current uh, pandemic and the, the hypotheses about how that uh, originated and emerged. And so, you know, managing landscapes on a multifunctional basis, integrating food, conservation, forestry, and all these different land uses um, can contribute towards food and nutritional security. There's one last bullet point there, Vito, if you don't mind. But of course, realistically, forests and trees alone cannot achieve global food security. But the point of our summit here and the discussions surrounding it um, is that we know that they can play a major role and discourse really has started to change in our understanding of how that change can happen. Um, last slide, please. So I just thank you and thank the organizers for inviting me to present. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Terry. That was great. And now um, Frank Roy from the Indigenous Partnership for Agrobiotech biodiversity and food sovereignty um, is gonna give us some examples of how forests and trees can be important in indigenous food systems. Over to you, Frank. Frank, you're, you're muted. Uh, yep, now we, we can hear you now. And uh, the video is not uh, working, no? Yeah. No, we don't see you, unfortunately. All right, okay, fine. <laughs> um, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm speaking from Rome, from the Indigenous Partnership. Uh, I belong to an Indigenous community of Northeast India. The Indigenous peoples have a sacred relationship with nature. Amongst the Khasis, my particular community, and the Karens of Southeast Asia, when a child is born, the umbilical cord is tied to a tree to signify the bonding and connection with nature. The indigenous peoples of Eastern Polynesia also have a similar practice. They bury the placenta of a newborn at the base of a fruit tree so that a substance that nourish the fetus, nourishes the tree. This sacred relationship with trees has given indigenous peoples the wisdom of walking softly upon this earth, of appreciating all plants, trees, and creatures, great and small. It has helped them to be also very aware of the bewildering biodiversity of the local ecology. It has led them to develop ingenious food gathering and food production system management systems. They plant many soil building trees in Swindon Fallows and integrate nitrogen fixing trees into Swindon lands to promote productivity. For example, the indigenous peoples of Northeast India from Northeast into Southwest China have adopted Aldous 
nepalensis as a nitrogen fixing species for a very long time, but it was only recently that it has been reported as a superior fallow species. Trees, therefore, are very much a part of our food system. This is indeed one reason why during this last two, three days uh, at the UN Food Systems Summit, we've been shouting from our hill, uh, hilltops that indigenous people's food systems are already existing game changers to build and boost nature positive production. We hope that the Food System Summit will listen to us. The indigenous partnership that I lead and one of our local partners, we conduct, conducted a mapping of agrobiodiversity and dietary diversity in 32 villages of Northeast India. We found on an average, a village has about 200 food plants, including crop varieties, mushrooms, and condiments. A few villages reach even more than 300 food plants. We also found that fruits to be the most diverse category of food plants. Many of these are fruit trees, with one village having between 30 to 40 types of fruit trees, both cultivated and wild. Yet despite the richness of fruit trees, only 25% of the respondents consume fruits in the preceding 24 hours. We have therefore been conducting dietary diversity surveys using FAO's dietary diversity scores to raise awareness about the importance of consuming at least five out of the 10 groups where plants that fruits can play an important nutrition role. We've been supporting this drive with food festivals and agrobiodiversity walks, where youth, elders, and some botany students walk through local landscapes to identify wild edibles, forgotten fruit trees and nuts, and trees of importance for food production in Swindon agriculture, and important for bees and other pollinators. These walks often end up near a sacred forest where a meal with the collected edibles as ingredients is prepared, often with some specially recruited chef helping community members to glamorize the use of local wild edibles, wild fruits and nuts. And this has been quite a successful program that has been part of our, of our activities. A few months ago, we studied the prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity in 18 indigenous villages in Northeast India using FAO's food insecurity experience scale. The study showed that severe food insecurity is virtually non-existent in these 18 villages, while moderate food insecurity in 2020 was experienced at around 11% as against the South Asia level of 44% and the global level of 30.38. This is an example of how the local biodiversity, the integration of trees and, uh, and other plants of the indigenous people have been able to uphold the food security of all. However, more work has to be done to enhance the nutritional status of community members through a better use of available local resources of plants and trees. We on our side will be happy to collaborate with Seaport and ECRAF to find out how to use traditional ecological knowledge and contemporary science to explore the potential of tree-based food production systems but within the framework of indigenous people's food systems. And our hope to ensure safe and nutritious food for all from within their own landscapes. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you so much for that inspiring talk. Um, okay, now um, we're going to hear from Alain, Traoré from Solidagro. 
Ella, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, my name is Alain from uh, Solidagro. I am in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso, it is a West African country. So I'm going to uh, explain you what uh, we are doing, uh, what Solidagro and his partners are doing to improve, to help, to have more uh, secure for uh, uh, food systems in uh, Burkina Faso for population. We are in a Sahelian country, and uh, we are uh, another uh, context. It is a population, uh, it is a poor country. So we have 85% of population uh, live with, they live with uh, agriculture and uh, they use forest, forestry. Um, things to, to, to satisfy their needs. And uh, agriculture is not really sustainable. Uh, this is like you can see in the pictures, people cut all trees and burn. And we, and, uh, we have uh, another uh, problem of um, uh, erosion, erosion by, by water. So uh, we, with this uh, uh, context, we are going to uh, propose solutions. Solidagro and his partners propose uh, agroecological agro practice. Uh, and uh, we use uh, right to food for all. So we use uh, approaches about uh, right to food for all. And uh, what is agroecological practice? It is just to make uh, a, a restoration degraded uh, uh, soils with, uh, it's, it is too, uh, too rapid, it's too fast. And uh, just uh, please could you come back to the last slide, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, we use uh, a, a lot of uh, products uh, about uh, zai and uh, a natural uh, fertilizers because we we know in the even people use more and more uh, chemical fertilizers their uh, their products their agriculture products going down and down. So it's important now to come back to natural uh, uh, products using uh, uh, agroecological products. Next, please. And um, we use uh, another products. Uh, uh, this is uh, FM, F, uh, assisted natural regeneration trees. And uh, this is to this is better uh, to to plant uh, trees in our countries because we are in a silent country and uh, we don't have uh, more than uh, sixty no uh, six hundred millimeters than or eight hundred millimeters of uh, rain so it's. It's, it's difficult to plant trees because we have just three months of uh, rain and we and the other month there is no no rain. Uh, we don't have water to give trees. So it's important to make assisted natural regeneration trees. And if this is local trees, it's not exported trees. Like a uh, next, please. And all, all uh, 
after we we make an uh, association to uh, associate the regeneration of local trees we promote now uh, we have a food and economic valorization of trees of, of uh, fruits leaves seeds nuts of all of trees so this is very very important this is this is, this is very important for populations because if we want uh, them to, to protect trees or to plant trees, it's important to present to them what is the, what they can have after the, the, this work. So we present them uh, a, a food, food valorization. This is what we can see in pictures. And uh, we have another uh, thing, it is economic valuation of trees. Uh, please, uh, uh, next. Uh, in uh, conclusion of perspective, I, we, we think uh, we have a, a good, uh, we, we are in, in a good way, but we need to have better coordination between uh, sectors like uh, agriculture, forestry, and other, we think it's important to improve a, a new mode of uh, a, a financing agroforestry parks the, and uh, to, to have more and more uh, farmers which engage with agroforestry. We think it's, we think another uh, thing, it's important to uh, give uh, a, like uh, financial incitative things to farmers uh, because uh, FNRB, like uh, this is, uh, uh, that FNRB, this is, and uh, agro, agroecology and agroforestry a work is not just for one or two years, but we have to work from a long term, like the five to 10 years. So it's important to have a big support of, of governments in the, or, donor, or donors. Like, next, please. This is uh, my last uh, slide. You know, uh, we in the, this is uh, uh, what we can have after five years uh, of uh, agroecology of uh, assisted natural regeneration trees uh, in this uh, in pictures. We prepare plants. Uh, we have, uh, this is another thing to have uh, um, um, uh, it's not very simple to have words, but uh, this is what we can have after uh, we work with our populations. Thank you for, for your attention. Ella, thank you so much, and your English was excellent. <laughs> I'm really glad. I'm really glad that you were able to do it in English. It was fantastic and very, very clear. Um, so next we have uh, Anna Euler from Embrapa uh, speaking to us about marketing of forest tree products and their livelihood opportunities. Okay, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy. Um, uh... Good afternoon to everyone that is uh, that are with us. Uh, I'm in, in the Amazon, and I would like to thank Sipor for the invitation and opportunity to debate such important topic for the quality of life of the, our society and, of course, for the whole planet. Also, I would like to congratulate my colleagues that made the presentation previously for such an uh, interesting and important contribution. So uh, I'm a researcher at Embrapa. Embrapa is a national research company committed to the development, development of agriculture in Brazil. 
Brazil is a country that exports food and feeds more than a billion of people worldwide. So Brazilian agriculture is very diverse. And I would say that we as Brazilians are very privileged because we can access food produced mainly by family producers. Uh, I work in the Amazon and this region, and in this region, food systems are even more diverse because we have a lot of forests and forests are a great source of food. Uh, and this, this uh, forest food and especially forest fruits, but I would say also fishes and, and so uh, are, are the basis of food security for a very large number of people, as I would present to you. Uh, please, the next slide. So I think it's important to remember that our forests have been inhabited uh, for, the, for over the last uh, 10,000 years. And the human presence in the past, different from uh, the present, was very important for the conservation of this great biodiversity. Uh, archaeological and historical uh, researches uh, show us that in the pre-colonial period, uh, indigenous people of the Amazon have already domesticated or semi-domesticated over uh, 80 species of food trees and, and other kinds of crops. Uh, current research show us that, uh, in, that in the Amazon forests, uh, there are uh, about 200 species that are considered hyper-dominant uh, hyper -dominant species. What means? This means that among more than 16,000 trees species ident identified, uh, these 200 species represent the majority of individuals, uh, individuals present in the forest. And, and I would say with emphasis for uh, food tree species as Brazil nuts and uh, different uh, kinds of palms. Uh, this is to say that we must value uh, ancestral knowledge to propose policies that consider the, the diversity of such food systems in the world. And um, I would like to talk about some, uh, so now I will talk about some very important Brazilian public policies and I would like to uh, ask the next slide, please. Okay, uh, in uh, 2009, the federal government uh, has created the National Plan for the Promotion of Social Biodiversity Product Chains, which uh, today uh, has recognized uh, 41 Amazonian food tree species that are uh, relevant for uh, uh, nutritional, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, food security and for uh, socioeconomics. Uh, they, it's important to say that this, this uh, food tree species, they are uh, produced in territories of the traditional people in Brazil. And when I say traditional people, I mean indigenous people, uh, rubber tappers, Brazil nut gatherers, and so on. And, uh, and, and, and this area represents uh, 25% of the Brazilian Amazonian territory. Uh, I want to highlight uh, one uh, product in special, the acai palm, a native tree of the Amazon. I, I will ask you the next slide, please. Yes. Uh, so, uh, the acai fruits are the basis of daily food for thousands of Amazonian people. Uh, this food uh, reached the international market in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, it's important to say that uh, the, not, more than 90% of the acai production comes from a native forest, over 1 million hectares of native forest, 
and uh, about 200,000 families uh, produce acai uh, in the Amazon, what means a production of 1.5 million tons of acai fruits every year. 85% uh, of these fruits uh, goes to the uh, regional consumption. Uh, so uh, it, it generates almost $1 billion of income to local producers, forest dwellers, and also to local market. Only 15% of the, the, uh, of the production is exported to other Brazilian regions and for international market, we we uh, we say we, we we like to say that acai is a food that it's a symbol of the Amazonian culture, uh, and again, it's uh, it's very important for food security, for health, for forest conservation, and income generation, uh, and not only uh, for income generation in the forest or in the rural areas but also in the cities. Uh, I would also uh, mention that the acai, it's, uh, it's uh, bringing a new middle class, uh, uh, a middle class people in the rural areas. Uh, and another benefit, it's like uh, young people are returning uh, to, the, to the rural areas to work with these, uh, 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 the, the forest management and, and the extractivism. Uh, Acai uh, may open the market to other uh, Amazon uh, fruits. And we hope that in the future, uh, the Acai from the native forest may recognize it uh, uh, not only as one important uh, source of food, but also as a product that helps the conservation of the Amazon, uh, the conservation of the culture, uh, uh, the traditional knowledge related to the biodiversity, and that the, 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 international, the national Brazilian market and the international market may differentiate the acai produced from the, the, the native forest and the acai produced from mono, monoculture and plantations that it's already ongoing. Né? And that we hope that uh, the acai uh, production chain will not repeat the case of the, uh, of the rubber and other, um, of other Amazonian uh, extractive products that had a cycle of uh, uh, native production and then migrated after for monoculture. Well, as the time is very short, I would like to conclude with uh, my final remarks, please. The next slide. Uh, I would like to say that, the, of course, the richness of the, of the forest trees in the Amazon is surprising. Uh, we, the, the, the federal policy now address uh, 41 uh, food, food tree species, but we have at least two or three times more uh, potential food species from the, the Amazonian forest. Uh, so it's important to associate uh, the, these, uh, these food uh, systems to the social cultural diversity of our population. It's important also to encourage the family diversification of the production, expanding the market for these products associated to their territories, their uh, uh, traditional territories, assegurating land tenure for the, for the local people, for the traditional people in Brazil. Uh, and finally, uh, to state and uh, to say that, that the dynamic conservation of this agri-food agri system may, uh, may be included as a strategy to reduce deforestation and to increase the human development index in such regions that have, in, in the case of Brazil, the, uh, 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 the lowest uh, HDI uh, for the whole of Brazil. So the next one. Well, thank you very much. Gracias, and merci beaucoup.
for everyone that are with us. And I hope to uh, answer some questions and, and hope to, uh, to make this uh, debate fruitful and, and that, that we can uh, make uh, um, uh, messages for the cupola, the, the, the World Forum that is coming. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anna. That was really super interesting. Um, so um, we're time is running running out a bit. Um, so we had a few questions prepared for our panelists, but I think we'll just have time for one. Um, so this question is for each of you. Um, so um, we know from all of your presentations. Um, and from other evidence that forests and trees play critical roles in our food systems. They have been delivering better diets and sustainability of food production. But um, as we saw as well in the Q&A, a, a few people were also asking about this issue. Um, and Terry mentioned it early on that they're still often overlooked. What do you think needs to happen to bring greater visibility to their role in transforming food systems. So I think we should, easy, it's easiest to just go back through the order of presentations. So Terry, why don't you take your, the first shot at it? Oh, I thought we were gonna go the other way around. Um, it's a tough one. I mean, I've been involved in the, the two um, sort of policy oriented process, the UFRO uh, consultation and also the CFS. Um, and I have to say, when, when the CFS report was presented um, at their summit in 2017, late 2017, the political feedback we got was extremely positive. Yeah, this, is, this is great, you're generating all this evidence. And I actually have it written in my, in my notes. Every single delegation who spoke, spoke very positively about the evidence that was presented, the potential roles of forests and trees, how that could be integrated into more sustainable land management, etc four years on what's happened nothing really so there, there's a missing link in the evidence and the policy and i'm not quite sure where that link is um i was on another um call this morning and we talked about this a little bit um and of course we're emerging from a very unprecedented period of time um the last 16 months or so have been pretty horrific for a lot of people and a lot of society and a lot of the economy i keep hearing this we're gonna you know come back better and all of that. And I don't know if this presents an opportunity for us to start thinking about the way that food systems have contributed towards biodiversity loss, towards deforestation, because it's been precipitated hypothetically um, by the pandemic in, in some ways, or well, the pandemic has, has been the result of, of this incursion into the forest frontier. Um, and the evidence still points to that direction. And there's a lot of movement in the in the academic world, but also in, in the development community to think about how can we have our agriculture in a much more sustainable way. So maybe this is maybe the entry point or the starting point. And this summit obviously is a fantastic opportunity to, to rethink those food systems. I think also the, the, the major problem uh, that we have discussed also is the reliance on technology. It's always about what technologies can we introduce to improve food security? When well, in fact, the technologies are there. Uh, I talked about smallholders, the complex management of these multifunctional landscapes. I, I suspect that we need to tap more into that and less into the, the sexy technologies that, have, that will be great for the groups that have developed them, but less impactful in terms of achieving food security and dietary diversity. Thanks so much, Jerry. Frank? Um, I think uh, what we need to do and accept is what Terry had said at the very start, and that is that we are functioning with a broken food system. And the second thing is uh, to recognize that there are systems uh, that have been in place for a fairly long time and with quite a strong evidence to support them that are game changers. I'm not so sure that this food uh, system summit will reach there because uh, from my experience, 
trying to push the indigenous uh, agenda to see it as a game changer has been a tremendous fight. And not because people are against it, but somehow they think this is a little bit of voodoo science, despite the fact. So I would say the first step that is required if we want to make a change is that one, they to acknowledge and recognize that there are existing game changers in the world today. That's, I think, the most important point. The second is the misinformation. We and all marginalized groups are considered as vulnerable. We are not vulnerable. As I showed to you, actually, many of our villages have zero reach, already reached zero hunger level. But we've been put in conditions, in situations of vulnerability because of our industrial agriculture, because of our extractive industries. So I think it's very important to respect the rights of communities, the rights of peoples, and the rights of women uh, to ensure that they can play a role. And the last point I think that I want to make is that, yes, these traditional systems or the experiences of the past do have their gaps, but those gaps can be filled by co-creation of knowledge that is intercultural. By that, I mean the, uh, the gathering together of traditional ecological knowledge and also scientific knowledge, but treating them as equal partners. But when we talk of technology, in, in ecological knowledge system, women play a very important role. In modern scientific knowledge, men and patriarchal values dominate the whole thing. So we have to get those values too and build the agency of women, if I may say, to bring that. That would be my small take on the issue. Thank you. Thanks so much. Ella? Okay, thank you. Uh, for me to have uh, more uh, visibility for, of uh, trees in our um, food system to transform a uh, food system, I think uh, uh, before it's important to have trees <laughs> because uh, in, in our uh, uh, case, we are in silent country and trees uh, are not uh, really think uh, we have, uh, it's not the most thing we have. So uh, it's important to have trees. Uh, uh, to have uh, these trees for us is uh, the first uh, thing we have to do. To, we, I think it's important to train our uh, producers, uh, agricultors to uh, combine trees and agricultural production. So it's the first thing. And to, uh, to convince uh, producers to plant or to protect trees, it's uh, very, very important to present them economic uh, uh, valorization and uh, after a, 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 so a, and after environmental things or others, because now producers need to have food, but they need money. So the first thing we have to present or to promote it is the economical valorization of trees. It's a, the research or other uh, person. Uh, can have can help us to promote what we can have uh, after trees. We can use them after in uh, um, in foods. The second uh, thing I I can uh, explain is uh, we we have to make advocacy advocacy about uh, politicals to put more uh, more uh, finance more money to promote ag uh, agroforestry in our countries 
And to, to make it ad, this advocacy, I think it's important for us to product evidence. This evidence, it is about uh, economical and nutritional and apart support of trees. This is what I think, because if we, we have evidence to present uh, a, to politicals, we, they, they can say, yes, this is interesting now to put more money in uh, this way because our uh, population can have more money and can have more food, a better food. For the consumers, I think we can say them, you are eating badly. <laughs> you, your, what you eat is not good, it is bad, and, to, and you have to sensitize them to eat better. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Anna gave some really great examples of, at least in Brazil, how some uh, tree products can bring those income benefits. So maybe there are things to be learned from the work that's being done in the Amazon for Burkina Faso. I know they're completely different landscapes, but I, I think it's really interesting to have some of this cross fertilization. Anna, how about you? Do you want to take a shot at that at that question? Yes. Uh, first of all, I think that something that was really successful and we we had great impact was to incentive the 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 local production focusing on local markets because we know and we love our food and we have to be able to assess this food. So, uh, but we go to the supermarket and we, we will find a very reduced amount of or disponibility of food, right? Uh, and mostly from agriculture system. So uh, this public policy that I would like to introduce you a little bit better that was related to uh, the public, uh, the governmental uh, purchase. So we have uh, public schools all over Brazil. So if the, if the uh, so uh, according to the law, uh, every city municipality has to buy at least thirty percent of the food school from the local uh, agriculture family agricultures. So family agricultures they produce local products. And in the Amazon, especially, they produce a food tree from the forests. So this was very, very, this was, and this is very important nowadays to foment, uh, 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 to, to, as I said, to generate income, to diversify the, the, the food systems, and the most important and beautiful, to protect the Amazon. Because if the people have the opportunity to produce from the forest, they will not convert the forest in agriculture. So uh, to develop this market, and we are not looking at international market. Brazil is a huge country. We have a, a, a huge population with power to consume. So uh, uh, I think this is one uh, very successful policy. Another policy was the social biodiversity uh, plan that started to, uh, 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 to really to focus on raising information about this production chain that were invisible. When we say that there is a federal law that states that 41 products are able to be in the, uh, 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 to be bought by the, the public, by any public uh, uh, institution. And I'm not saying only schools, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, even prisons, that, that we have a, a huge uh, a, a, a population that must be fed every day. So if at least 30% of the food that are served daily to, in, in this public uh, 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 sites are bought by, uh, uh, are bought from the uh, local uh, families, agriculture families, this means a huge market for them. And this means a huge incentive for uh, 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 the diversification of the production. Uh, of course, we have other strategies also to promote uh, open markets, uh, where uh, to promote uh, organics 
and, and uh, agroforestry and agri, uh, como é que fala? agroecological certification. Uh, of course, the private sector has a big role. Nowadays, a lot has been uh, saying and, and talked about the environmental uh, ESG, né? environmental sustainability and governance. So the private sector assuming uh, compromises uh, uh, with the food security production chains. And this means uh, uh, a better relationship with, with the, the surrounding uh, uh, producers and uh, uh, a, better, a better image to the, the, to the consumers, um, uh, local consumers and international consumers. So uh, in the case of acai, for instance, as I said, uh, someone asked me, uh, if, the, if the acai production chain was pulled by uh, uh, the government or the private sector, it was pulled by the private sector, but now uh, the government comes with uh, a whole, uh, a pool also of public policies to organize this production chain. And as I said, I hope that the acai can be one flag species for thousands of, of other species that we have here. When, when you put the acai uh, in, the, in the national market and international market, we hope that consumers can be uh, more uh, sensible or sensitive that, uh, to other Amazonian products. Uh, well, I will, I will stop here. Uh, I think that uh, this is my contribution for now, but I just would like to, to say to everyone that's watching us now that from, we, we, uh, we have a lot of other delicious fruits in the Amazon that are completely unknown, uh, even for Brazilians from other regions and especially for uh, uh, the international audience. Thanks so much, Anna. I know there's so much to say. <laughs> and I, I've learned so much actually just in this in the short period from all of you and all of the different experiences and lenses for looking at these questions. Um, we put together some key messages. Vito, could you share the screen? Um, so uh, this is just like the snappy, short, shortened version. Um, of some of the key messages that the panelists um, offered before the, the talks that come through the talks. The first is that there are game-changing solutions that are already exist. So I think both Terry and Frank made that point. So we don't necessarily need sophisticated new technologies to produce healthy food sustainably. Using agroecological principles, including the integration of trees for food and for services is an existing game-changing solution that humans, including indigenous communities have used for thousands of years and that we can build upon. We're hoping that um, people can see, especially the summit, these are messages that we'd like to bring back to the summit. Um, tree foods not only provide us with healthy nutritious foods that are in short supply in current diets, particularly fruits and nuts, but they also bring ecological benefits. So why are we not investing more in these nature-based solutions? So we, we um, advocate for recognizing trees as a nature-based solution for healthy diets and the planet. And then um, as Alain was saying in his, in his comment, the sectors, agriculture, environment, uh, food security, nutrition, health, and climate, all of those sectors and policies are not integrated in most places. This is a lost opportunity for optimizing the contributions that trees, but also that agriculture can make for healthy diets. So we need to have more multi-sectoral collaboration and joint policy development. And then um, as, um, as Anna was saying in, in her talk, Diversity in food tree species is associated with sociocultural diversity and is important directly for food security. So both Anna and Frank gave examples of communities. Um, in both cases, they happen to be indigenous communities with uh, diverse food systems and diverse diets and healthier diets um, in some cases than the national average. And then finally, it didn't make it to the slide, or at least I, I don't see it, but the last point is a very simple one, but a very important one, and maybe the easiest hook at all, 
the majority of fruits grow on trees. And we all know that we need to eat more fruit everywhere, almost every country, I think, except for three in the world, people don't eat enough fruit. So there you have it. Thanks so much. Apologies for going over. Um, thank you all to all of the panelists for very inspiring and interesting talks. And thank you to all um, of the participants who asked wonderful questions. And if you don't, didn't feel like your questions were answered, please send me the, uh, the organizers the questions and we'll get you answers from our panelists. So thanks again. Have a wonderful night or afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank Very you. good questions, Amy. Uh, <laughs> you should get them to uh, the secretariat uh, uh, very, in a very strong and aggressive way. <laughs> yes, I'll share. I'll share with all of the panelists the the write up, um, and I think Terry also um, added one that didn't get make it to the slide, and I'll make sure that everybody endorses it, and then we will send it to the organizers. So thanks, thanks again, everybody. Good job, Amy. Well done. Thanks, Terry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Vito, Susan, Gibson. Thanks for all of the support. <coughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. So how about the, the, questions that are in the, the questions that are in the chat, we still can answer? Yes, um, we can still okay. answer them. Okay. We'll, yes, we'll put them out 